Science and sacred knowledge often walk on different sides of the street, so to speak. But where trees are concerned, Diana Beresford Kroger forges a path built on their combined wisdom. She is a botanist, medical biochemist, and author most recently of To Speak for the Trees, My Life's Journey from Ancient Celtic Wisdom to a Healing Vision of the Forest. And she joins us now from Merrickville in eastern Ontario to explain. Diana, it's so good to sort of meet you virtually as it is these days, but uh, <laughs> thank you for coming on to TVO tonight. How are you managing during this pandemic? Oh, it's horrendous, really, isn't it? Absolutely horrendous for everybody across the globe. But this is the first step in pandemics. Expect more. Expect more. Ouch. Well, mm -hmm. I want to take you back because <laughs> there is something kind of ironic about your coming from Ireland, which I gather is one of the least forested nations in the world, and yet trees have become such an important part of your life. You want to explain that for us? Yes, well, I'm uh, the last child of the kings of Munster, of the south of Ireland. And uh, I was orphaned when I was very young. And all of the ancient knowledge of the Celtic world was given to me as part of my inheritance. And I was given a sacred trust at the time when I was 13 to carry this knowledge into the new world, that is North America, because at the time of now, it would be needed. Now, that sounds very strange, but it's true. <laughs> now, you say you were orphaned very young. Uh, I want people to understand, when you say very young, you mean very young. How old were you? Oh, I was 11, 11 years old, and my whole family was wiped out. And, and um, I know you talk about mm -hmm. it in the book. I, I, I hate for you to go into too much detail, because I know it's got to be painful, but, but no, can you not, tell us? No. <laughs> No, no, it's not painful at all. Um, everybody was wiped out. And what happened is in Ireland, if you're an orphan, ir irrespective of the fact that I come from aristocracy, uh, an orphan is put in an orphanage. And an orphanage is equivalent to the same kind of schooling that the Aboriginal people had here in North America. It was a punishment system run by the Catholic Church. And I, being uh, the granddaughter of Lord Charles Beresford, uh, Admiral of the British Fleet, and um, various other people, oh, well, I'm related to the royal family very closely, actually, um, in England. So the judge was terrified that he'd lose his job if he put me in the orphanage. So he gave me a choice. He pulled me into his chambers, and I was, I was just really scared of this man. He had a big brown... He had a wig on his, uh, on his head and he had these, you know, the usual things that judges wear. And he said, Diana, I, you, it's your choice, which was very unusual at the time. So I was given into the care of a bachelor uncle who had never married. He was a famous hurler. He hurled with Christy Ring and the president of Ireland at the time. And uh, he was a very famous man. And... I was put in the charge of a bachelor at the age of 12, 13 under the court system, which is very strange. <laughs> <laughs> strange indeed. And we have to say his parenting techniques might not um, stand up to much <laughs> scrutiny today. But clearly uh, it developed in you a sense of resiliency that, uh, I mean, look at you today. You have a marvelous disposition. But I want to get to the <laughs> core of this ancient Celtic philosophy that obviously has been such an important part of your life. What is at the core of it? Well, um, now, now, I have to tell you something else, Steve. Hmm. In the summertime, I was sent down to the countryside. And the countryside, uh, the whole area of the south of Ireland was what my family was, uh, they were the kingship of, the kingship of Munster. And I was sent down there as a young child. And the people there of the Valley of Lachines decided, they decided, about 22 people, they decided that I would be given the ancient knowledge. Um, the laws of the Celtic world are, um, are based on the Brehan laws. And actually, they're being polished off right now. Um, and the Brehan laws covered most of Europe. And I was taught some of these laws I was taught all kinds of things in Gaelic. That means Ausgaelga. Tom, a kind Ausgaelga, I'm saying to you right now, I'm speaking in Irish. So I was taught in Old Irish, all of the old things, and um, the laws, the Brehan laws, and the laws of the trees. 
Hmm. So let me no. follow up on that, yeah. the laws of the trees, because it, it mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you will tell me the science behind it, but I know just sort yes. of emotionally, spiritually, we feel great when we're outdoors surrounded by trees. We don't know the science behind it necessarily, but you're going to tell us. Why is that? There are compounds called alpha and beta pinene that are liberated from the forests, um, from the evergreen trees here. And actually, there are all kinds of other compounds that I know scientifically. But the, the alpha and beta pinene are enormously important. And what the pinene does is that it you breathe in so much pinene, it affects all of your nervous system and it affects your brain, but it affects affects the T-cell ratio of the body. And this has just been found by the Nippon Medical School in Japan and OneSup and various people across the world. Um, some physicists in MIT, some physicists in Germany um, using cloud chamber techniques. I guess I should have been more careful in my language when I asked that last question. I shouldn't have said, we don't understand. I should have said, I don't understand, but you're going to tell me, and you just did, which is wonderful. Yes. Now, now you have managed to live a life where the so-called sacred and the scientific intersect. And I wonder if, yes. um, again, how, 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 does, how do you make that happen? How has that informed how you've lived your life? Well, um, that's a very long question for me. Um, it has informed me because I think we cannot let go of the sacred in life. You cannot look, I cannot even look at you right now without recognizing your DNA. My DNA recognizes yours. And the actual pattern language of DNA is so extraordinary. It's absolutely extraordinary that you cannot just look at this and say, there is not a divine intervention behind all of this. It's, it's just literally impossible. If you're a scientist, you understand physics, you understand chemistry, you understand biochemistry, you understand the motility of the body and, and all of life around us. And in fact, the Aboriginal people were correct. It is a tapestry of life. The trees supply oxygen into the atmosphere that you and I are breathing right now. How can you deny that, uh, that the unity of life is not an extraordinary thing. So um, there are many modalities that I could talk about um, by way of mathematics and so on and so forth. But I think I'd, you know, I bore the blazes out of the listener. So just say, <laughs> take it, take it at that. But I, I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we will take your word for it. Um, yes. You know, I, I, we're in such a cheery mood right now, and I hate to bring the mood down, but the reality is, <laughs> If you look out on the west coast of the United States right now, the trees are having just one awful time. Um, the picture, we're gonna show you a series of pictures here. Yes. And it looks, yes. I mean, it looks almost apocalyptic. This is Madeira County in California from a yes. couple of weeks ago. And then let's mm -hmm. flip Sheldon to the next picture. There's the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, an iconic image yes. everybody knows. Mm -hmm. But the, I mean, the, it, it's orange. It's orange from the glow of the yes. fires. And then let's go to Clackamas County in Oregon, which has also been hit hard. There's almost no visibility there at all. I know, um, Diane, I'm a big baseball fan, and I was watching a game uh, out of Seattle the other night, and there yeah. was this yeah. awful haze that was infecting the whole stadium, and you, you had yeah. trouble seeing the action on the field from all of this. Is Mother Nature trying to tell us something right now with these wildfires on the left coast? Yes, yes. The last time I was down there, of course, I was lecturing down there, and also doing the film called the Fo Call of the Forest that um, has gone over, uh, gone all over the world. Now, um, let me address this situation in, in California. When I was down there, I did lecture about the planting of eucalyptus forests within the great forests of the West Coast. They didn't want to put in the, the cryptomeria. They didn't want to put in the sequoia. The redwoods back in because it was too much work. They put in the eucalyptus Australia. Now listen very closely to this. If you are a chemist, if you look at the eucalyptus, eucalyptus oil, which is born in all of the eucalyptus species, the, the Meritaceae family, the oil of eucalyptus, if you put it into a closed cup, which is a scientific experiment, it 
Earth. Its flash point is at 48 degrees centigrade. The temperature of Australia, of the temperature of California, reached that point and went beyond it. It is a fireball. Those trees become fireballs. Mm. And the fire sheets that are, that are shed across California are partially, or in many part, because of those eucalyptus trees. They should never, ever have been planted in California. And I warned them and I warned the governor about that maybe five and six years ago. And yet, what, because of their own hubris and stupidity, they disregarded your advice and did what they wanted? Oh, the whole scene about the value of those trees down there is a whole political scene and a money scene. But I am saying to the people of California, stop planting eucalyptus species. Keep them in Australia where they are needed in Australia, but take them out of California. Hmm. How much of a risk, uh, I mean, those pictures have scared a heck of a lot of people, obviously. And yes. we're wondering mm -hmm. how much of a risk we have here in Ontario of experiencing that. We, we uh, run a very, very, very little risk of that happening here. Um, but we've been doing some very stupid things here in Ontario. We've taken out all the hedgerows. The fields have become oceanic fields. Um, and the forests, we ha the forests are essentially coming down in Ontario. And nobody's keeping an eyeball on this. Nobody's keeping an eye on the forests in all of, of Canada, really, as a matter of fact. We are 1% virgin forest out on the West Coast, and that too looks like as though it's... People are really fighting to protect it. So we're, we're in no great shapes here in Canada, and I want to stop that if I possibly can. Um, now, let me address for here where you're living, uh, Steve, and for where I'm living here. There is very little chance of, of that kind of forest fire happening um, because the sheets of flashing of fire, the fireballs, it's almost impossible for that to happen here. Okay, but I, I'm okay. For argument's sake here, let me push back a bit because I'm I'm imagining yeah. there are people with the ministries of natural resources, for example, or with timber companies that say we do, you know, we 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 take responsibility uh, for the forests of this province and for this country, and we do the regularly controlled burns, and we try to make sure that we manage things in such a way so that kind of thing can't happen. Are they not doing their jobs? Um, I think the regulations for Canada need to be very closely inspected and really changed. Um, we are looking at climate change and Canada is doing very little about this. So um, the whole process of forests and the fact that the forests are coming down is more important than you realize because the, the, the forest is the only modality of taking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We have over 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It is causing climate change. In Canada, we have a vast wilderness of forest. We have the boreal forest to the north that very few people know about. And that forest must be maintained and must be protected. We need in Canada, believe it or not, to plant more forests because we've taken down so much and we've taken them down so cheaply. And I would say to the foresters and all of the people working in this industry, the word sustainable. I want you to think about maintaining the forests as they stand in Canada and adding to them. And this is a message I have for all over the globe. The whole globe, we need to do this. It is the cheapest way of stopping climate change. Now, go, let's go back to the fire systems, Steve, here in Canada. If we happen to have freezing rain, if we happen to have, have very bad freezing rain this coming winter, now they did have it a couple of winters ago out on the West Coast, so there's a lot. What happens is the freezing rain shears the branches off trees and it shears the branches within the forest. This has happened in, in, uh, out in BC. It has happened in the, in, uh, about 20 years ago here, in, here around this area. There is no way 
that we have the money to be able to clear the whole forest of the trees coming down and of the branches coming down. There's no way. We just can't do that. So it's it's a fire hazard. And you, that's the one fire hazard we have. Well, let me pick up on what you just said, because you have talked about the need for a global bio plan. That's right. What's that a reference to? Now, the global bio plan is the cheapest, easiest way to stop climate change. And it can be done by everybody on the planet. And it is so simple and it is fun to do. But let me explain this to, to you and to all of the listeners about something. I'm a scientist. The most important equation on the planet right now is the photosynthetic reaction. And what that is, you take carbon out of the atmosphere, you put it into sunlight, the carbon breaks into two, you get oxygen in the atmosphere, that's what you're breathing right now, and carbon goes into the trees. The, car the trees and the forests of the planet are the green machines that manage to oxygenate our atmosphere. You take down the forests and you take down the ability of the green machines to, to utilize the carbon. It's that simple. We've taken down too much forest. So We've what does that mean then? Too much forest. Okay, what does that mean? I, I mean, I'm working right here in the middle of uh, the biggest city in the country. What, what, does that, yeah. what does a global bio plan right here in this, you know, what many people would call too much of a concrete jungle, although there's a lot of green in yeah. Toronto, but what, is a, what does that kind of plan look like here? The plan, and I'm involved with some of those plans, is put a forest back into the city. Where and how? Oh, that's too complex a question right now, but it is happening. Um, you've got lots of space. You don't have that many green spaces in Toronto. But the green spaces that are there need to have a forest in them. And the forests in them will actually protect the people and the people's health. Right now, you've got a pandemic in Toronto. And I'm asking you, where is there a plantation of white pine? That's pine astrobus, so that the people of Toronto can go in and make their immune systems more effective. They're not, they're not there. They don't exist. You know, there is a view out there that says we're too far down the road and not enough people care about this or feel that they can do anything about it. We're all doomed. What's the point of trying? What would you say to those people who believe that? I'd say to them, that's rot. <laughs> because the most exciting thing in the future is the green economy. The most exciting thing in the future is actually a new form of energy. And the new form of energy is photon energy from the sun. And that shows a thing called entanglement that Einstein thought was the weirdest thing ever in the world. And he called it the, the, the weird effect of photons. So we have, we have the ability to produce quantum, uh, quantum computers and we have the ability to produce free energy from the sun by way of the entanglement of the photonic energy. And they're working on it down in the States. They're working on it in, in different universities. Okay, I want to now pivot to the teachings from the Celtic alphabet that you have introduced, introduced us to rather, uh, the Celtic alphabet of trees, which is fascinating. And I want to read a little quote from your book here to set up this next question. This is the first alphabet of Europe, you tell us, in which every letter is named for a tree or an important mm -hmm. companion plant of tree. This alphabet gave birth to the literacy of Ireland. Words like car and hospital, that are still common today, come to us from that ancient language. The philosophy behind the language carries a way of thinking about the rebirth of the forest, namely to consider how intimate the connection is between forests and humans. Now, I wonder if you could take us through a, a, a couple of letters here and just sort of show us how this works. Let's start with the letter D. On that, and on that, the first great uh, alphabet in the world, of course, is Sanskrit. And in dar, in Sanskrit, dar is, if you can hear the enunciation, is the oak. And in the Celtic language, now let me reframe, it's not the Irish world, it's the Celtic world. Let me reframe the Celts for you. The Celts were in Ireland, the Celts were in England, Scotland, the Celts were in Germany, Hallstatt in Germany, all of the Baltic, all of the Baltic countries, they went down into Turkey. The, the great part of Turkey is uh, 
was Celtic, and they went across to the Ukraine. The Celts were in Ukraine, and they went into the central part of China. This was a huge, huge civilization. So going back to the word on Dar, the Dar, the oak, was their most sacred tree. Hmm. And the Druidic culture were, were not just straight weirdos, they were the Aluna. They had the greatest materia medica in the world still standing of today. But because Ireland was the victim of all kinds of things in the 500 years war in Ireland, all the Irish are, are really thought to be kind of inferior in thinking. But we are very far from that. They wanted the medicines from these trees to be protected. That's why they initiated the alphabet, and that's why the alphabet is still used to today. Huh. What is your favorite tree of the alphabet, if I can put it that way? Ah, it has to be for me because I've done so much work in blood work um, and in surgery, and it's the dar, on dar because it has viscum album, it has mistletoe coming into the dar, and that's used in the surg surgical wards today. And can you spell that word for us? Which one? <laughs> da, dar, is Vizcama, that how you... D-A-R. D-A-R, okay. Dar. All right. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to be part of the Celtic alphabet, but you write that hickory trees hold a first-class status in the fight against climate change. Want to explain that for us? Ah, yes. Hickory trees. Now, listen to me, Steve. I'm very excited about my hickory trees <laughs> because I, <laughs> I have managed to get the Acaria lacanosia. These are the king nuts. Um, they're almost gone from this country. And I managed to get five nuts of the Acaria lacanosia. Actually, it was only about nine months ago uh, down around Windsor. I did um, a talk and a film down in, around Windsor. But these trees are almost gone and they have a double embryo in them, and they are producing twins. I mean, it's just unbelievable botanically. It's, it's, I'm, I'm so excited about this. Diana, let's finish up on this. How is it that you manage to maintain your enthusiasm and zest for all of this in the face of so much cynicism and skepticism and, frankly, misery around the world? Well, it's because I was given a sacred trust as a child. I was told when I was 13, 14 years old that I would be the last voice of the ancient world of Ireland, the ancient Celtic world. I was instructed and told to become as educated as I possibly could be. And God knows, I mean, just last year I was given an award the same as Kofi Annan, the same kind of award. Um, and so I've, I've strived to do this, but they told me I would be the last voice, the last child of the ancient Celtic world, and to take this knowledge and to give this knowledge and this wisdom to the people of the world today. And I'm busily doing it. <laughs> you, you sure are. <laughs> well, I have to say, I, I thoroughly enjoyed your book. Let me hold it so that there we go right there. That's the one. It's got a beautiful cover. To Speak for the Trees, My Life's Journey from Ancient Celtic Wisdom to a Healing Vision of the Forest. Uh, what does one say, Diana Barris for Kroger? But keep on keeping on, okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and thanks Thank so much you. for joining us on TVO tonight. It is my pleasure, Steve. My pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.